Welcome to Achieve Wealth through Value Add Real Estate Investing. This is the show where the guru hype is banned and you get direct insights from commercial real estate operators. If you're a passive investor, this show can help you better understand investment opportunities. And if you're an active investor, the lessons from each episode can help you to become more effective in your own deals. Now, here's your host, investor and author, James Kandasamy. Hi, audience. Welcome to Achieve Wealth Podcast. This is James Kandasamy. Today, we have a guest who is, I would call, as a super passive investor. His name is Jeremy Rowe. Jeremy is investing, has been investing in real estate and businesses uh, starting 2002. Left this uh, full-time job in corporate world in 2007 to become full-time passive cash flow investor. So keep in mind that you want to underline that word, full-time passive cash flow investor. He's he has invested more than 70 opportunities across more than one billion worth of real estate and businesses. He's a founder and president of Roll Investment Group. He manages a group of over a thousand investors who seek passive managed cash flow investment in real estate and businesses. He's also a founder for Investors by Investors, a Phoebe, a nonprofit organization that launched in 2007 with the goal of facilitating networking and learning among real estate investors in a no sales pitch environment. Jeremy, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me here. I just want to apologize in advance. I'm a little sick, so my voice is a little off, but I'm very happy to be here. Thanks for having me. You sound perfect. So... <laughs> put a label on your profile, especially because, you know, you have invested more than 70 opportunities. So is this all passive investment across different LLCs? Yes. I've never been an active investor. And in fact, I have over 70 different opportunities right now. Um, In fact, I've been in over 100 over the 17 years that I've been investing for sure easily. So I like to be what I call like hyper diversified. I just love diversification to help reduce risk. So how many LLC are you invested currently? I don't know the exact number and it changes all the time because like, for example, in the last two years, I was involved in 24 sales because it's good timing to sell. And I'm currently involved in several things that are under contract to sell. And I'm always like, I made several investments earlier this year already. It's we're early, early 2019 was we're recording this. So I don't know the exact count. I actually, when I'm going to sit down with my accountant in a couple of days before taxes, I'm going to actually recalculate it all. But my estimate right now is roughly about 70. That's uh, what happened when you're passive, right? You don't even know how much uh, LLC is investing, which is perfectly fine, right? As long as the money coming in, I guess, right? That's exactly right. It's all about the, the passive cash flow. Yeah. So why did you choose to be passive investor? So um, the first I'll say is that um, I started looking for a different way to invest out of the stock, uh, stocks and bonds in 2002 after the dot-com crash. Mm-hmm. For me, the two pieces that I got fed up with with the stock market after the dot-com crash back in 2001 where there was a volatility because I'm a really low risk, slow and steady guy. So to watch the market go up and down 30% in a year just wasn't for me. And then more importantly, frankly, the lack of predictability for my retirement account. That's actually what bothered me the most. So not knowing where my retirement account would be in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, just didn't seem like a good retirement planning for myself. And so I started to look at different ways to invest. And the reason why I focused on passive is because I was way too busy in the corporate world at the time to do anything active. I was actually working at Disney headquarters in Burbank in Los Angeles at the time. And um, I focused in on passive cash flow, kind of lower risk pass, passive cash flow, because that's, that's what I thought was a solution for me for that lack of predictability. So I focus on more predictable cash flow in terms of what I try to find. Okay, got it, got it. So you have been investing since 2002, and you said here in your bio, you've invested in real estate and businesses. Can you split the percentage between real estate and businesses? How much percent in each one of those? Sure, yeah. I would say I'm very highly concentrated in real estate, and even amongst real estate, even though I do single family and all the different types and commercial, I strongly prefer commercial. And the reason why I prefer commercial is really because I like tenant diversification, back to that diversification theme. So for example, when I invest in an apartment building, I usually target 100 units or more. And a mobile home park, it's going to be 75 lots or more if I can find that. Uh, Self-storage, I prefer 800 units or more, You know, maybe do a little bit less. But the point is that I love having diversification. And so that's really where the good fit for me was. And that's kind of my my bread and butter is really finding a stabilized 80 to 100% occupied Class B type of commercial real estate property. Um, and I just want to go to sleep tonight, wake up tomorrow, and not much has changed because I live off the cash flow. So I'm dependent on the predictability of the cash flow. Uh, but the commercial real estate is really my number one focus. 
Got it. Got it. So throughout your experience, you have seen a lot of a lot of deals that comes across your table, right? How many percent from the total big funnel that you're seeing? How many percent that you're choosing to invest? First of all, how many percent you're choosing to at least evaluate? Uh, let's go before that, right? How many percent that you immediately kick it out? And why do you kick, kick that investment out? Yeah. So if that's that's, I don't track the numbers myself. So it's hard for me to really predict. Okay. Uh, this is going to sound crazy, but probably right now, because I believe we're at the end of a cycle, I would have to say that and, and if, I mean, I'm easily not investing in le- le- certainly less than 1%. Like right now, to get even, to make it worthy of even looking at, because I'm very concerned about pricing across all the asset classes anywhere. So if it's not 10% or better below market value, like true market value today, which is very difficult to find. It's just like a non-starter for me. I just feel like the cap rates are too low. I'm not comfortable and I'm a much happier seller. So I'm mostly on the sidelines at the moment, waiting for a downturn and an eventual uh, adjustment in pricing to get back in. Um, but right now, it um, takes a lot for me to look at a deal, I have to tell you. So you're saying right now, you would reject 99% of all deals that comes across the table. Easily, yeah. And I, I'm, I'm very pessimistic in that if somebody sends something to me, it's like, I hate, I'm almost going into like, this is never going to work, you know, right now, because it's, if it's a market rate deal, I'm not going to look at it. So I'm very pessimistic when I get something. But what would you look at? What's your sniff test? Um, well, it's going to depend on the asset class. Um, so, but the starting point for me is, is the price standing out to me? Is the cap rate standing out to me where I think it's very different than a normal market rate deal? And, um, also is the structure for investors at least aligning with what I look for, right? But the number one thing that I'm weeding things out on right now easily is cap rate and pricing. It's really that simple. But how do you decide cap rate? Because cap rate changes by market and value add. You know, entry cap rate is always uh, very Great. weak, right? Great question. So I have a very specific target that I have. So I'm kind of in this small box. Of course, there's a thousand ways to invest. There's nothing wrong with them. But the way I do it is I look for something that's typically 80 to 80, 200% occupied, stabilized, may or may not have any value at upside. It's optional. Class B property in A or B market outside of California, because I look for higher cap rates and higher cash flow. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, I start to drill down from there, depending on the asset class and little tweaks in terms of what I'm really looking for. So um, I can give you all kinds of examples, but uh, that's kind of the high level. And so if something doesn't fit that box to begin with, then it gets discarded and then I'll take it from there. What about operators? How much emphasis do you put on the operators? Honestly, I tell people that I believe that the operator is more important than the property. Um, I, I truly believe that the number one thing to look at is the operator, who you're making a bet on. And the number two thing is the property itself. I want to be clear, the property is extremely important. But to me, who I'm making a bet on is vital. Um, I like to tell people that, you know, you can invest with the... I can invest. I live like a couple blocks south of Beverly Hills in Los Angeles. So mm-hmm. I'll use this example. I can invest in the best building on Rodeo Drive, which a lot of people have heard of, with the best tenants, right, in the prime area. And it can be 100% occupied. But... If the manager runs it into the ground, it will get foreclosed. We'll give the keys back to the bank and literally have nothing. And it didn't matter where the property was, how good it was. It'll all come down to the manager. So for me, <clears throat> always making a bet on somebody and, and in passive investing, I like to tell people that I like to tell people that I trade control for diversification. So because I'm giving up control, who I'm making a bet on is absolutely vital. So you're basically your uh, Number one criteria is the operator. I mean, if, if you don't if you don't like the operator, of course you're not going to even look at the offering. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. If, okay. Yeah, and yeah, if I already know that I don't like the operator, I'll never look at the offering. Okay, got it. So maybe that's probably the first sniff test. See, if you if you do not know who the operator is or you do not know the credibility, you're just not going to look at the even the offering itself. Well, no, I, I can jump into a deal where I've never talked to an operator before, uh, but um, I would say that. The easiest first pass for me at the moment, certainly, is cap rate and valuation because that knocks out over 99% of the deals immediately. It mm-hmm. doesn't matter who the operator is at that point. It could be the best operator that I love, but if, it, if I don't agree with the pricing, I'm not even going to look at it. But don't you think the operator knows about the deal more than passive investors? That's a great in question. In terms of the, the cap rate cap. and the opportunity? Yeah. So um, two things for that. Number one is, um, look... You and I can have a different opinion about what we'll pay for an apartment building, right? And so not, neither is necessarily wrong. It's just subjective. So I have my limitations of what I'm comfortable with, and an operator may have a different opinion. And so you, you know, as a passive investor, 
you have to have your own opinion about what's okay, what isn't okay, as far as what you're comfortable with, aside from what the operator is doing. I will say this as a second answer to that, which is my approach to operators is trust but verify. And what I mean by that is they're going to know much better than me how to run any property of any asset class, no matter how, how many I invest in as a passive investor. That's just a fact. Mm-hmm. But what I need to do myself is trust that they know what they're doing if I get comfortable with them. But I always verify a lot of things up front, including did they do proper analysis of the area, the location, the, the market, uh, the, the sales comps, the rent comps, um, and all the different factors. So I'm going to kind of trust, but verify. And then the verification process, if I don't agree with something you know that's subjective, well, I may pass, but honestly, there could be nine other investors standing next to me who would invest. So oh, there yeah. is, yeah, there's definitely subjectivity to this. So, so how do you verify? Let's say today I gave a, a webinar today, right? Uh, saying this is the opportunity, this is how much. And so what are, can you describe the steps that you take as an experienced passive investor and where you come to a decision point where you invest in that deal? Yeah, so I'm going to keep it high level because we could talk about this in depth for many hours. But mm-hmm. high level, what I do is the first thing I try to do is let's say I don't know an operator at all. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, I'll try to assess their personality. And what I have kind of determined I'm comfortable with is I look for people who are uh, conservative, which matches my personality. So the first thing I'll try to do is read the summary, take a look at the numbers and determine if the operator is conservative or aggressive. What I mean by that is, are they setting um, low expectations using conservative assumptions to possibly under promise and over deliver to build long term relationships with investors? Or are they looking to overpromise, make the numbers look really good, attract investors, but we're not sure how that's going to perform. And as a personality fit for me, I'm looking for someone who's definitely conservative and is looking to underpromise and overdeliver. So the first thing I'll do is try to assess if they're conservative or not at a high, high level. Okay, and that's got to match for me. Um, after that, I'll get really into the pro forma and the numbers. So I'm a numbers guy. So I'll go through all the revenue and expense items, as well as all the assumptions, ask a lot of questions and make sure that it's that trust, but verify it. So it doesn't match up with what I think is reasonable. Do I think that their rent increase assumptions are reasonable? Do I think that the expense increase assumptions are reasonable? Do I think that the exit price is reasonable? Is the expense ratio looking okay for the type of asset class that it is relative to what I normally see in that type of asset class in that location and a whole bunch of other variables. Okay. Once I get past financial analysis, what I'll do is I'll dig into did the operator, uh, like how does this property look in terms of how we're buying it relative to other comps? Are we getting a good deal or not? Are the rents at market rate? Are they below or above market rate? And did the operator run all that analysis, right? So you want to dig down and make sure that the operator did their homework, understand why the operator likes the deal and see if it aligns with, you know, see if you agree or disagree. Cause again, it's subjective. Um, and then I, I get into like the demographics and stuff and say, is this a good location? Not just specifically the address, but the region, the area, is it growing? What's the population growth and economic growth been for the past 10 years? And where is it heading in the next 10 years? And by the way, did the operator do their research to find all that out? So what I do is I actually ask for a lot of the operator's research mm-hmm. and I'll verify what they've done. And then I may cross check it against some other data sources, depending on how thorough they were, or if I have other sources, I'd like to check myself. Um, once I've gone through all this, I personally don't invest with an operator unless I met them in person. Um, and before I get to that stage, if everything else is checked off, I'll actually run a background check on them and all the managing members of the manager. If that checks out, okay, I'll fly, typically fly to the property. I'll get their opinion, on not just the property, but a tour of the surrounding area and what they like about the area and why they chose that particular property. And then um, basically, the in-person meeting is really important for me as a final gut check. Because again, I'm making a bet on a person and the person's the number one thing for me. And so I'll go through all those steps and if everything checks out, then I'll move forward. I mean, we, I'm skipping a lot of things, right? No, no, I'm sure there's, there's a lot of yeah. steps. being. I mean, I didn't even talk to you about the contract. Like I look at the operating agreement. I read every Absolutely. word. Absolutely. Make sure that everything looks, there's a lot of stuff we can get into, but just try to keep it really high level. Yes, yes. But let's go a bit more detail into that, right? Because I think it's important because... There's a lot of passive investors who are who will be listening to the podcast, and I think it's important that they can take some action items and implement into their investing as well. So, so in terms of financial analysis, uh, do you run all of their numbers again, taking their rent roll and PNL and run it on your own, or how do you do that? No, it's a, it's a trust but verify. I don't have like a okay. template that I use. I'll get their spreadsheet. Mm-hmm. I'll, I'll actually take a look at every line item, mm-hmm. and then I may run some scenarios myself 
In other words, what happens if the rents only grow 2% instead of 3% per year? What happens if the expenses are actually higher than we thought? But what happens if the cap rate on the exit is different than they thought? What's the effect? And I'll take a look at all the returns, the cash flows, the IRR, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Um, So I'll take their model and I'll trust but verify it's the same idea. So you rerun back the uh, assumptions that the data, based on the data that's given to you, right? Yeah, I'll look at the sense. I'll make. I'll do what I call a sensitivity analysis on what. Got it. Got um, but I'm also going to verify that I agree with. So, like, I actually get down to the level of saying, okay, like the line item of payroll, how what percentage is increasing per year? Does it look right? Health insurance is that really increasing correctly? Did they actually adjust for the new tax base? Will mm-hmm. it be an adjustment necessary for the new tax base? And did they adjust enough? You know, very specific things. But I'll go line by line because sometimes the operators just a place of pure 3% growth rate on expenses across everything. Mm -hmm. Other times they actually adjust literally down to the light item. And you got to dig in and understand why they did that adjustment for each one. Does it look correct to you? So it's a, it's again, a trust, but verify situation. So yeah, that's, that's an interesting um, (laughs) trust. I mean, verification that you want to do, because as I said, it's important that passive investors, I mean, even in my book that I, I, I published in Amazon, it's important that each passive investors, take a deeper look into who are they investing, what are the deals they're investing, which market that they're looking at, right? So um, so after the financial analysis on the market itself, how would you get the make market data? Let's say a lead sponsor, a sponsor giving a number, 3% income rent growth increase. How would you verify that data based on the market? Yeah, so it's interesting because um, what I would tell you is that I am looking for someone who's conservative. So if I see a two or two and a half or even 3% number, and I know that if I can verify that the economy has been growing and it's been going okay and that the population has been growing, um, then I don't mind applying that across. Where I get a little more nervous is questioning why is it 4% or 5% per year? Why do they use that assumption? And especially in the first couple of years, if, if they're adding a little value add or something, what percentage was that for each first year? Why is that? What are they really expecting in the rents? And you can like, for example, you can really get into taking a look at uh, comps of rents mm-hmm. and looking into what percentage rents you're below market, how mm-hmm. much it's going to increase, and then cross-reference that compared to the increase in revenues they're anticipating. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you can do a lot of things. But for me, it's not like I'm trying to reinvent the wheel. I'm not trying to like re... Uh, how can I put it? I'm not trying to start from scratch and then say, this market's increasing at 2.57%. There should be 2.6% on the okay. spreadsheet. What I'm doing yeah. is saying, is this spreadsheet reasonable? Is this area growing more high level on mm-hmm. a trust but verify type of concept? So based on your recent experience, which area you think has the most growth nowadays? Yeah, so I invest in a lot of different areas. Um, I don't just target one or two areas. So um, so what I would tell you is that the, the areas that, that are kind of automatically interesting to me are um, because I tend to avoid large cities and hot places like Seattle, Denver, et cetera, those prices are too high for me. And so I avoid those just, and they're also hot. I try to stay away from what's hot because I look for cash flow. Mm-hmm. And so long story short is that Texas and Florida are projected to be the number one and number two states for um, mm-hmm. population growth in the next 10 years. And just, there are many different areas in Texas and many different areas in Florida, and some will benefit and some won't. But the idea that those states will benefit as an example interests me because we're starting off on the right foot in those states, for example. Whereas you can look at it the other way around, Illinois, having a lot of population outflow. I actually got a deal yesterday or the day before from Illinois. And I literally, I passed for a different reason, but my second reason why I was considering passing was because it was in Illinois to begin with, just because I know there's been a population exodus. And when I have so many options as a passive investor and I'm looking to be low risk, there's no reason to me taking on any incremental risk when I could just move on to the next deal, right? So... Mm-hmm. Um, so those are some of the areas that I'm looking at or staying away from, but it's high level, you know, and even in Texas and Florida, you've got to look down to the exact location in the area to understand what's going on in that exact location or area. Mm-hmm. Uh, but those are some states that I like right now that are obvious. Uh, there's plenty of others. And what I've learned too, is that many states and most states have really good areas and many states or most states have really bad areas and declining areas too, even Florida and Texas. So absolutely, uh, absolutely. and tertiary areas and stuff that are more volatile during downturns. So, you know, I don't have a specific area I target on. I more evaluate each area as it comes into play as I look at an opportunity. Got it. Got it. So can you give me an example where you thought the deal was good and you, you invested with it? 
but later you realize the deal is not so good for some reason and can we we can go into details there but is there a deal that you thought this is a really really strong deal but it didn't work out after a few years um so i have an example i can give you it's my favorite example um okay. it was actually the only foreclosure i was ever in um but it's going to take a couple of minutes is that okay yeah that's fine that's that's where we learn right and which year this thing happened sure so it, it's a really interesting story with a lot of good learnings so Um, this was 2008. Um, mm-hmm. I actually was convinced there was going to be a downturn. I wasn't worried. Like for this particular property, I had no concerns about the downturns because okay. even though it's 2008, <laughs> okay. right? It was a 300 unit um, student housing property, mm-hmm. and frankly, I thought it was a great um, uh, counter cyclical play in that students go back to school during downturns. So when it's hard to get a job, so I was actually like, "This is a great investment." So you were like trying to reverse engineer and say that hey, this is a this is the right. thing to do during downturn. Absolutely. So um I invested with an experienced student housing operator. It was a 17th property. Um it was a first property across the street from a state university campus in Michigan. Okay. And it was, you know, for all intents and purposes 100% occupied, right? Hmm. So we bought it in 2008 and um first few years, no problem, great cash flow on target. 2012 I think it was. Um in the spring, we get a letter from the city and all the students got letters from the city all the occupants saying that they have to close the bridge to campus that you have to walk across um because of repairs because it's going to be the summer months and you have to do the repairs in the warm months but don't worry it's going to be open in time for the fall season we know you need the bridge open because you're students right mm-hmm. but not everybody believed that and the occupancy rate went from 100% to 65% roughly oh. now frankly at 65 we would have been about break even it wouldn't have been much of a problem The biggest pro- the bigger problem is that when we bought the property we assumed a loan that was due that fall. So mm-hmm. when the bank went to appraise the property it was only 65% occupied that particular time we couldn't we couldn't refi it. It's just the numbers didn't work out. Mm-hmm. And so um the sponsor tried to negotiate a one year extension on the loan because what was obvious is that the next year we would have been back up to 100%. So um but I think the bank just wanted the property because they wouldn't extend the loan for a year which is really odd. Mm-hmm. And so we ended up foreclosed. Mm-hmm. Now, had we done a, uh, instead of assuming a loan, had we done a 10-year fixed rate long-term loan, we would have been totally fine. And had it not been for that exact year that the bridge was closed, because that was perfect timing literally. It was like there's many 1% risks in every deal you can't avoid. This is a great 1% risk story, okay? But the story's not over. So basically the sponsor lost um some money in a partial recourse loan, quite a lot of money. And what they decided to do is actually because they were pretty wealthy and they owned most of their properties themselves, they weren't syndicated. They actually without anybody asking transferred everybody's equity interest from that property out of their own equity in another property they owned that was another first property across from a state university in Texas. Um and it took about a year of legal work to get it all done so we had no cash flow for a year. Um but then I'm still in that deal today, still getting cash flow. Um so I haven't got so- cash flow yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a lot of lessons to be learned there honestly, but it's a great. So the first thing you want to learn is that you cannot predict everything in a deal no matter what. There's always 1% risks that you can't even think of that will come up, okay? That's why diversification is important in my opinion. Number 2, mm-hmm. is that we talked about who you're making a bet on before. You know, the person I made a bet on was not just a good operator, but someone who out of their own goodwill decided because they felt bad for the investors to like transfer them out of their own equity. That's a question of who do I make a bet on? What decision are they going to make in that circumstance, right? They had no legal liability. They couldn't have forecast that the bridge was going to close, Correct. right? Yep. So, and they tried to be negotiating. They already lost money on a partial recourse loan. And so, that's a question of who did I make a bet on? And another really interesting uh lesson is that this is not mandatory for me, but what's really interesting is that I've learned that wealthier sponsors can take care of have the option of taking care of problems in certain circumstances that not as wealthy sponsors can't do. So for example, if something comes up unforeseen and there needs to be a cash call from investors, okay, for some reason, it's it's possible that a wealthier sponsor would choose to make a loan themselves and not borrow the investors for the cash call, right? right? If you're not wealthy, that's not even an option. In this case, I have to have two combinations come into play. One is uh making a bet on a really good person, and number two is the them actually having the mentality of wanting to help investors at that tough time and they had the, the the wealth to be able to do it they had to have the wealth and the general personality combined right they could have the wealth but not necessarily have the personality that it wouldn't matter so Correct. really lucky as an investor making a bet on the right person 
very unlucky with the circumstances and a really good lesson uh, in many different respects. Oh, that's that's a very interesting uh, scenario there. But that's, I mean, the thing is, is out of control of the sponsor, right? But was, is there any other deal that you, based on your assessment, you know, you thought everything was working out penciled out correctly, and but somehow once the deal started, you missed out something. And the deal. I have another story about um, what I would call a manager dispute and then a mismanagement after. But you're mm-hmm. talking about the. Are, are you talking about something like that? Or are you talking about like a performance of a? Well, I'm talking about your confidence going into the deal, but you were proven wrong. Um, you know, a couple of years after the deal start operating. Oh, um, there's some something wrong in your assumption that you learned. Like my assumptions. Yeah. Uh, God, I have so many deals I've invested in. Um, <laughs> something that sticks out, right? So, <sighs> I performed very well or performed really bad? Um, well, I can give you an easy perform very well. I mean, I've, I've been in a few of those because you have to understand when I go into a deal, I expect it to be a 10 year deal and I'm just investing for the cash flow and I'm looking for predictability and reasonable returns. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll give you a couple of examples. There was a deal I invested in 2005 in Canada, where I'm from originally. Mm-hmm. And it was a two story office building, medical office. Our plan was to actually buy it, rehab it a little bit, like elevators, a common area, that type of thing, bring it up a little bit. So we bought, I think, for $5.5 million at the time. It was highly occupied, probably over 90%. I don't remember the exact percentage. Mm-hmm. Well, at that timing, with the market continuing to rise, we actually got an offer for $12 million two years later, and we jumped wow. on it. We actually hadn't even bothered to, to upgrade the elevators and stuff quite yet. And so you know, that's just like meant to be 10 years, exited in two years, didn't expect it, right? Um, another example is I invested in several self-storage properties in this cycle, 2013 through 15 with the top 30 operator in the US, 10 year business plan meant to hold for cash flow. They were going to increase um, rents over time, increase occupancy rate. Well, we bought them at re- really good deals. We bought them really well. They were all unusual circumstances off market. Say we paid between seven and a half and eight and a half cap, mostly eight to eight and a half cap or low eight cap, which was actually probably 100 basis points better than market at the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, cap rates have compressed since we sold three of the four properties uh, off last year at roughly five and a half to six caps. That's a huge compression from an eight to five and a half cap. Okay. Yeah. And um, again, was, we did not mean to do that. We just wanted to buy it right and hold it, but we took advantage of the timing of the markets. Keep in mind, I was in 24 sales in the last two years. Mm-hmm. A lot of those sales were capturing, just like these examples, where we ended up in the cycle and weren't necessarily going for the full 10 years, but were actually much shorter term than they expected based on trying to capture and locking in kind of more peak pricing, so to speak. So is most of the deals that you are in, do you does the passive investors get the voting rights to decide together as a team on whether we want to sell or keep? Yeah. Normally, in most of the deals, there's voting rights. Um, and I have to say, as an individual investor with a very small percentage of the votes, there have been times where I've been able to lobby the, the actual sponsor to consider investing or maybe help them push them over the edge. I don't have much influence in that. I'm a very small percentage of the vote. But the concept of considering to sell, et cetera, you know, as an investor, I'm a little proactive in that because I like, I'm like i conservative, so I prefer to lock in a price and then you know, sell in 2017 or 18 wait and then reinvest when the price is adjust. That's just my own mentality. By the way, okay. I've been in situations where sponsors haven't agreed with that. And I'm still in those properties now that I'd still love to sell today, but they're not going to sell because the sponsor doesn't necessarily agree with the timing and mm-hmm. is what it is. You know, but that's part of being a passive investor. So based on your experience, at what point should an asset be sold? At what are the what are the performance indicators that you think that, okay, this is the right time to sell? Yeah, that's a tough question because it's going to depend on the, uh, the profile of the property and the purpose of the, per- the acquisition of the business plan to begin with. Okay. So, you know, that's going to vary. Like if you're doing stabilize, you're doing value add, if you're doing development, if you're doing a five-year term, a three-year term, a 10-year term. So it's hard to answer that question. I don't know if you want to make a more specific question. Well, let's say you're getting a 10% return cash on cash today, right? Uh, yeah. But if you sell it, you're going to get 200% return of your money. We, I mean, of course, you have to include taxes, right? But so which one would, would you choose to get? go ahead with a 10% cash on cash? Or you want to, let's sell it now, get me, get me the 200% return. Great question. And I know a lot of people have different opinions about this, okay? Some people Absolutely. hate selling because they want the cash flow, right? Mm-hmm. I personally would rather lock in a really good price because normally when you see that type of increase and return and what I'm investing in, it's because of some cyclical effect. Like I'm not investing in heavy value ideals, so we're not adding the value. So that means okay. it's like okay. value. 
And that means if we're selling at that type of return, we're locking in a gain based on timing. And if that's the case, I'd rather lock the gain in and redeploy the capital myself. Because what I don't like happening is if we miss peak and then go through and watch it go down in value and the cash flow can continue, but there's risk into holding it, right? So I'd rather lock it and then redeploy it at the right time. But that, that's like just my own one person. So you rather sit on cash and wait for the right time? Yes, 100%. I find there's two different mentalities and a lot of investors I talk to. Some uh, don't mind sitting on cash and waiting for the right timing for peace of mind, which is exactly my approach. Some mm. people want, are like hell bent to have every penny working for them at all times, mm. which I completely understand. And they're the ones who maybe won't want to sell whatever. And so just a different way of thinking and different philosophy. Got it. Got it. Got it. How much emphasis do you put on reducing taxes in your investment uh, criteria? Yeah. So, um, I mean, look, in most of the things I invest in, they're going to have depreciation and expense flow through, and they're going to be tax deferred in, in either all or most of the uh, cash flow. And so, mm -hmm. and plus I get to, to benefit from uh, favorable tax rates on recapture and capital gains. So um, I do absolutely check in the opportunities I'm investing in, will I get my pro rata share of the depreciation and expense flow through? Because frankly, that's dictated by the sponsor. They can choose to give you that where they could choose to take all the depreciation or some of the depreciation. I've seen them. Really? All. I didn't know that. Oh yeah. <laughs> I thought oh, depreciation yeah, yeah. And I've had opportunities before, you know, so I'll tell you what, there's three different things I see sometimes. One is that you get your pro rata share, which is the most common. Mm -hmm. Another one is let's say there's a 70, 30 split sponsor and um, investors. Then the sponsor may take 30% of the depreciation. I see that sometimes. Mm -hmm. And then I've seen where the sponsor takes all the depreciation for themselves. You have to read, you have to look in the fine print. That's why you've got to read the legal documents because frankly, you wouldn't know that without reading the legal documents. That is an awesome tip. I don't think so. I've ever heard about it. What I've heard in the past is where sponsors take some of the depreciation of the IRAs because IRAs can't use really the depreciation, oh, yes, right? Yes. I've seen that kind of case. And that sometimes, you know, I think it's a fair thing, right? Uh, even though I don't do it, I just prorate uh, everything to the investors. But I never heard about 70 30 split and taking all the depreciation. That's. That's interesting. So, you know, passive investors out there, go and look at your legal document and make sure you're getting your share. The operating agreement, which people hate to read, is the rules of the whole thing, right? It's the rules of the company. You have to read it. I, let me tell you some other stuff I've seen in the operating agreement you've probably never seen. Mm -hmm. There was a deal I found two, three years ago. I was shocked that if there was a cash call, okay, mm -hmm. and you didn't actually pro provide the capital within three business days, mm -hmm. you would be diluted out of 50% of your shares. Wow. <laughs> now, listen to this. It didn't stipulate you would get your pro rata reduction. So they could have asked you for a dollar legally. Okay. You may have not received it, weren't in town, didn't pay it. And you could lose half of your shares over a dollar cash call, theoretically, because wow. you didn't pay it in three days. I mean, you've got to read the legal documents. Wow. That's crazy. But it happens, right? I mean, you have seen a lot of... Uh... Uh, uh, offerings out there, right? So let's go back I, to it. I, I just want to say when that happens and when I see that, I walk away and I feel horrible because I know that investors are going to invest, like they're going to get the deal closed mm -hmm. and investors will have no idea what they're dealing with because anyone who's investing, I know at that point, just haven't read the legal documents, which mm -hmm. is scary. So, have, you, have you ever got into a case where there was fraud happening by the sponsor? So I had one story where there were two funds that I invested in a single family. And I have very few of these stories, thank God. But um, there was one... <laughs> actually, I think this is the only fraud or mismanagement I've really ever been in to a very big extent. So there were two single family buy and hold funds for five years that I invested in in 2012 and 13. Mm -hmm. And I knew two of the three managers really well, made a bet on them. And the third guy was... Um, he was like a back office IT guy. And he, was, he had a manager share, but he wasn't actively involved in the operations. Okay. Well, there was a there was a dispute between the two guys I knew well and the third partner, and the third partner got the two guys out. Oh. And next thing you know, this the third partner was mismanaged, and there was I wouldn't say there was fraud, but absolute mismanagement. And so, in fact, I stepped in personally. It was something I did with my investor group, and I stepped in personally, and I actually negotiated getting all the properties back in exchange for us releasing him from hmm. potential liability. We took the properties. I found a new property manager and we sold the properties off within a year. After that, they were well managed. So I was very involved in dealing with that. It was quite interesting. Um, but um, thankfully, that's you know been a very rare occurrence. Uh, but I've definitely been through that once. Yeah. It's always tricky right? when passive investors want to take over 
a sponsor role because I think all the loan documents and everything is written on the sponsor's name, right? I mean, yeah, this was different. You know, you make a very good point. Commercial real estate would have been much more challenging. This is single family. Oh, single family. Okay, got it. Yeah, it actually, that actually made it a lot more feasible, to be honest. Yeah. No, I've seen uh, when commercial, there's, you know, there's limited partners, which is passive, and there's GPs, which is active. And when active are not performing, the LPs try to take over the GPs role. But I don't know how that's going to work because, you know, the bank, all the loan document is based on GP's name, right? And LPs are LP, right? So, yeah. No, it's a good point. I want to say, though, for those of you listening, I know we talked about the one foreclosure I was in and this mismanagement, but I think there's only one other opportunity I can even think of and probably one to 200 opportunities I invested in and never had a problems like this. It's a very, very small percentage. Got it. Got it. Let's go back to a different topic overall, because you have been investing since 2002 um, and then 2007, 2008, and then now it's 2008. is what, almost 20 years? Is that right? It's about 17, yeah. 17 years. Okay. So the demographic has shifted in terms of the, the whole syndicated commercial real estate, right? So I think 10 years ago, nobody really, I mean, maybe there was a lot of syndication happening, right? I think 1986 is where there was a lot of, just before the 1986 crash, where the tax law has changed. Uh, I think the uh, Reagan's uh, tax law has changed. A lot, of, a lot of deals were syndicated, but it was syndicated for the reasons of, uh, you know, avoiding taxes, right? On active yes, income. Yes. After that, it become more like a, a make the money. I mean, like 506B, I think 506B, maybe that's been there a very long time, but 506E yes. and then crowdfunding came in. And a lot of people, when 506B was established, but you know, in the past 10 to 15 years, or maybe the past 10 years, right, when the economy is boom, a lot of clubs have popped out where the demographic of investors have changed, right? So it used to be, you know, um, I, I'm not sure because... I started in 2015, so I'm not really sure how was the demographic before that. So you can tell us how was it before that? How, what was the thought process in terms of syndicated investing, syndicated commercial real estate investment, and how the people have changed? Can you describe that whole process based on your experience? Sure. Yeah, there's definitely been a few things that I've noticed that have changed, and you know, I keep in mind I'm one person's opinion, so someone else may have different. Absolutely. Yep. So. Between 02 and 07, what I found is that it was easier to find kind of $25,000 minimum investment amounts mm -hmm. in 506B type structures. Once mm -hmm. we had the downturn, uh, a lot of people got scared. And then once we had an upturn again, there was a lot more money chasing a lot of deals. Um, the minimum seemed to come up to like more like 50,000. So that's one thing I've noticed that was different from when I started. Um, another thing is, you know, until the advent of crowdfunding, um, it was all private deals, right? And, mm -hmm. um, so I did a ton of in-person networking. Everything I had to find was always through networking. And so I did a ton of in-person meetings that I went to personally, co-founded my own meetings in 2007, as you mentioned in the bio. Mm -hmm. And so it was a lot more networking in person that had to be done compared to today, potentially, if somebody wants to successfully find a lot of opportunities. That's changed. Um, 2012, I think, is when they passed the ability to do a 506C, which is public marketing mm -hmm. for credit investors only. Correct. And what I have found is that since that has come up, a lot more deals are for accredited investors only, whether the 506B or C. It's Correct. become more commonplace. And another reason is because there seems to be more and more money entering the space of interest in investing in these. As more money has come in to invest in these types of opportunities, the op operators have had the choice of taking money from accredited investors only, whereas before, in, in the early 2000s, I think they were more open to accredited and non-accredited because it was harder to actually raise the money, in my opinion. So I've seen that happen as well. Uh, the 506 C with the public marketing has definitely changed things where you can actually now publicly market to investors before it was all private. And so that's changed things a little bit. And the crowdfunding sites have certainly changed things as well. Um, and uh, that's um, opened up a lot more opportunity. It's, it's a lot more availability of opportunity more easily where you can kind of sit in your pajamas and download opportunities and find them very easily. I had to go and go to meetings to find opportunities. It was a lot more work. So mm -hmm. I would say the accessibility has increased. The minimum investments have probably increased. The requirement to be an accredited investor, which is also the requirement to be on the crowdfunding sites, has become more prevalent. So in some ways, it's easier to invest now because you have access to more deals. It's harder because the minimum investment is typically higher, I find. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also harder because you've got to be an accredited investor to have access to more of those, to, to that larger volume of deals. Um, those are some of the things coming to mind. So what about, so you are saying in the 506C and then 506, no, sorry, 506B and then 506C and then the crowdfunding, right? With the Jobs Act that was popped out, right? Yes. Um, do you see 
role of the sponsor changing because I think in those days they have to have a lot of relationship basis. So you have to know the sponsor directly, right? So that's what you're saying. You have to go to a lot of networking. There was a lot of investment yes. club which sells the pre-existing relationship networking, right? As a basis for their business model, right? Yes. But now you don't really need that. You have five or six C, you know, if you find someone who's advertising for it, you can jump on it, right? But but still, I think, you know, you you know, there's there's a role of spon- uh, the sponsor relationship with the passive investor that could have shifted, right? What do you think about that? I agree with you. So what's happened is that with the crowdfunding sites who are mostly intermediaries, you're not necessarily investing with the sponsor directly. The whole concept of having an intermediary has become more prevalent. So the one thing I forgot to mention that I've seen in the last probably three years, since 2016, has been the advent of a lot more investor groups who basically will um, aggregate investors and be a middleman. And so you're investing in that LLC, which is then investing in an opportunity, but you're not talking directly to the sponsor, you're talking to the middleman group, who's actually the one that vetted the sponsor. And so that's become a lot more prevalent. It's also made it easier for investors to find more opportunities because those those groups tend to be marketing groups, right? That's what they do. (laughs) They try to find investors. And so if you're an investor, it makes it just even easier to find opportunities because now you've got crowdfunding sites and groups besides going directly to sponsors. And that's been a trend very recently. Correct. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, equity raises, right, uh, which has been using that marketing skills and networking skills to raise money for an operator, right? And I think an operator who's really good, who's like just to want to buy deals, they can use all these equity raises. So, but I think the gap between the passive investors to the backbone of the business, who's the operator, is wider. I agree. Yeah, if you're going to go through a group or you're going to go through a crowdfunding site. You're not right. talking directly to the sponsor. And it's interesting because if you go back to the beginning of this podcast, what did I tell you, in my opinion, is that the number one thing you want to make about a bet on is a sponsor. So right. I've actually never invested in a crowdfunding deal. And I'm actually an advisor for Realty Mogul, but I've never personally invested in a crowdfunding deal for two reasons. One is because I have the network build up to find the sponsors directly. So the returns are going to be a little higher compared to going through intermediary. Mm-hmm. But also I get to talk to the sponsor directly, which is an important piece of it for me as far as the betting process. Got it. Got it. Yeah, it's one thing that was really interesting that I found in the beginning is like you personally meet the operator, right? Which is, I think that's really, really good because you know, you get that gut feel check, I guess. Yeah. And I want to be clear though, that like, you know, if someone's really busy in the corporate world, they can't necessarily fly out to look at a property on a Wednesday, right? And meet mm-hmm. an operator. So <laughs> the crop finding sites are definitely adding some value, right? Because they're doing a lot of filtering themselves. And so for the right target, like for me, I do this full time, so I can actually go do that. But if you can't, if you're listening, you can't do it full time. The trade off of going through an intermediary is that they're going to bet that person for you, but they're going to bring you more opportunities. And, you know, if you don't have the bandwidth to go find them yourself or you don't have the bandwidth to go meet people in person. So there's definitely a good place for all of these intermediaries, et cetera, and mm-hmm. add value to the right people. Just for someone like me who does it full time, I have the opportunity to find everything directly. So I don't want to, like, I don't, I don't think that the groups and the crowdfunding sites are necessarily bad because they're making. Mm-hmm these opportunities more accessible. They're just, there are they're some people that's a good fit for and some people it's right. not that good fit for. Yeah, some people just don't have the time, you know, where they, to yeah. go around and ask people, but they rely on the crowdfunding credibility, I guess, right? And to yes. vet the sponsor. Okay, got it, yep. got it, got it. So uh, any other things that you want to share with the audience that you have never shared in any other podcast? <laughs> um, I have to say one thing, which I always say, I'm sorry, but it's, you know, right now, I think we're at the end of a cycle and being very, very conservative. And if you're relatively new, I think it's a fantastic time to learn, but I also think it's a dangerous time to invest just from a timing perspective. So you're going to want to, you know, if you're relatively new, you want to be extra cautious right now and make sure that you agree with the valuations, the cap rates and everything else before you jump in. Um, so that's one thing I always like to pass along. Um, trying to think if there's anything else I could share. It's something I've never shared before. Mm-hmm. Uh, Something that you think oh, I should have mentioned that to the audience in all the other podcasts, but you never get a chance. This is your open floor for you to. <laughs> yeah, um, I would say, you know, you know what? We I talk about this a couple of times, but I think that one thing about being a passive investor that can be difficult, and a lot of people don't. Well, two things. One is that the, many people don't think about always run a background check. Um, it saved mm-hmm. me several times. I find most passive investors don't run them. And I think they're critical. Okay. How do you run it? Uh, I run them. Well, mine, I run mine through a website called TLO, like Tom Larry. Oh, TLO. But yeah. a lot of people don't have access to that. Right. I know. That's hard. So TLO is owned by TransUnion. And like the police use it to give you an idea. I actually yeah. know a police yeah. candidate. Yeah, I use, I use TLO. 
Yeah. So as you know, it's very hard to get access to. You have to have a real office. They actually come inspect you in person, make sure you have a lock on the door, the, the room that you're keeping the files in. And it's mm-hmm. very specific. They run a background check on you. It's very hard to get. Another one that's actually similar, I don't know if you've heard of, is Accurant, which is... Oh, yeah. The Lexus, Nexus, Accurant. Lexus, right? Nexus owned. So those are the top two kind of best known. If you yeah. don't have access to those, another thing you could do, which I used to do before I actually got access to TLO, is you could hire a private investigator who has mm-hmm. access to these types of sites who mm-hmm. actually run those reports for you and interpret them for you. And you'll pay more than if you just run it on TLO directly, but it's still very valuable. And I'm telling you, running background checks on all the managers is very, very important. Um, the so other if thing, you run on all of them, all the GPs? All of GPs, yes, 100%. 100%. So you need their first name and their last name, and some, you can use their social, and somebody you can use their address. I, I know how TLO works, but how? What, you're not going to ask social security from them, right? Right. So here's what I do, because um, as you may know, we only really need a name. And if it's an uncommon name, you can figure out it's not right. It's a common yeah. name, it's harder. So what I do, what here's what I do. I ask the sponsor, I say, can you give me your first and last name, your date of birth and your home address? Okay. okay. I don't ask for social because I think it's kind of going over the line, but um, you can if you want to. Uh, but um, I ask for these three pieces. And if they're hesitant to give it's a test. So if they're hesitant to give it to me, I kind of will wonder why and I may walk away. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't need their home address. I can ask for their business address, but I ask for the home address. I don't need, need their date of birth. If I, I match up the address. Yeah, like you just need three information. So I do it as a partial test. And I do a lot of things like this as a test, kind of a read between okay. the test. So that's what I do. Um, and um, But background checks, very important on each GP. Um, the other thing I want to share is that um, I do a lot, spend a lot of time thinking about the future. And so if you're going to invest in a 10-year deal as a passive investor and you're kind of locked in and that it's, it's illiquid, it's hard to sell, You've got to think 10 years down, okay? Mm-hmm. I think a lot of investors are looking at the deal and saying, this looks great today. This is a great market today. But are they thinking five or 10 years ahead? And so when I invest for predictability, that's especially important for me, right? So the question I have for you is, can you tell me how self-driving cars and robots and technology are going to affect office demand in a certain location? Can mm-hmm. you tell me how it's going to affect retail demand in a certain location, especially with internet shopping happening online in five or 10 years? Mm-hmm. Hard to predict, right? Easier to predict, will apartments be in demand five or 10 years from now? Will mobile home parks be in demand five or 10 years from now? Will self-storage properly probably be in demand five or 10 years from now? Even that's a little nebulous because you know you can argue that you won't need them because people will be able to use the drop-off service and they'll go into an industrial storage facility. But the point I'm trying to make is that I don't find people think really far down the line and you have to. So I've been investing, I call for a recession since 2013. And it doesn't mean I thought there was going to be a recession in 2014. It mm-hmm. means that I want to get in something today at that time that I thought was going to do well during a recession because I was looking at a 10-year horizon. I thought there was going to be a recession around 2018, which was wrong. Mm-hmm. But the point is, is that I was thinking that far ahead to avoid the landmines. You've got to think far ahead if you're going to be locked in for a long term and not just whether the deal looks good today. Very important. Got it. Got it. I have to ask this question because this has been always on my mind. Whenever people bring, whenever broker get me deal i always question why me right i mean i always try to find out why they're bringing a deal to me because there's so many buyers out there right just to qualify you know me wasting time underwriting a deal so the question for you is why should i mean in this done age of uh, cycle right i mean why does a sponsor able to go through your your difficult underwriting process of the whole deal, you know, unless you're bringing in the, a big chunk of money, right? Uh, why do they want to go through that all that questions and allow you to invest rather than you know opening up the floodgate and there'll be so many investors who doesn't want to ask questions, invest with them? That's a good question. Uh, first of all, there is no doubt that there are some sponsors who just won't deal with me. Okay, mm-hmm. once they start to see that I start to ask questions, it's not worth their time. A more experienced sponsor will have a harder time with it. And I don't blame them, to be totally honest with you. Mm -hmm. Um, I have a little bit of leverage um, compared to a normal investor um, because I have my own investor group, but I also have access to like a network of other groups. And so sometimes they'll know that and they'll be willing to deal with me in exchange for all that. So I'm not a normal investor in the position I'm in. And I can leverage things to get access to things and to actually get time that some of the other people won't be able to do. Um, that That being said... You know, if you're a passive investor and you can't get the information you feel you need to get comfortable with the deal, walk away. There's too many deals out there and just move on to the next, right? You want to be 100% sure you're comfortable because you're getting locked in for a long term and you're giving up control. It's very important. You feel 100% comfortable going in. If you can't get that comfort level, 
just walk away and move on to the next. Awesome. Awesome answer. So that's, that's one of the questions that I want to ask, uh, you know, uh, to you. And I think we are at the end of the podcast. I think that's it. Thanks audience for attending and listening to achieve wealth podcast. Uh, if you have not joined our multifamily investors group in Facebook, go ahead and search for multifamily investors group in Facebook and join there and uh, see you soon. Thanks Jeremy for being here. James, can I just say one more thing? Oh, sure. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, just if anybody wants to reach me, the easiest, oh, sorry, way, yeah. Yeah, no the easiest way to reach me is, is via email, um, which is jroll, J-R-O-L-L, at Roll Investments, which is R-O-L-L Investments with an S dot com. So jroll at rollinvestments.com. I'm happy to network with anybody. I'm happy to help people any way that I can. I talk to new people all the time to help with my experience and looking to, I'm trying to find other opportunities. I love networking with other investors to trade notes. I'll, I'll talk to anybody. So any way I can help, you know, feel free to contact me. Awesome, Jeremy. Thanks for joining us today. I think that's it. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. That's it for this episode. If you'd like to learn even more, check out James's free audio book. It's the audio version of his best-selling book on passive investing. You can get the audio book completely free along with other valuable resources by visiting www.achieveinvestmentgroup.com forward slash free audiobook. Also, be sure to join our Facebook group too. To find it, just do a Facebook search for Multifamily Investors Group. Thanks for listening. Join us again for another episode next week. See you then.